Okay, so thank you very much, David, for those kind words. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to be speaking to you today. So the title of my talk is Chemistry in the Cosmos, um, From Simplicity to Complexity. And this talk is actually an outgrowth of a talk I gave at a very interesting meeting last year in Jerusalem uh, entitled The Grand Challenges in the Chemical Sciences. This was a meeting uh, on chemistry. I was the only astronomer attending this meeting, so it was educational both ways. So chemistry in the cosmos. So here's the cosmos in a famous diagram. One of the remarkable things about the universe is that it's evolving. We know the universe is expanding. It started out in a very dense state and has been expanding. And during this expansion, stars have been forming, galaxies have been evolving, um, and structure has developed. More recently, the universe has started expanding in an accelerated fashion uh, uh, due to the mysterious so-called dark energy. Another very important cosmological fact is that uh, New York City is at the center of the known universe. <laughs> <laughs> we have a cosmological model uh, today, um, which is remarkably consistent with Einstein's general relativity. Um, there are various components uh, to the uh, matter energy, mass energy in the universe. These components, the, fra the relative fractions change with time due to the, the different uh, equations of state, so-called, of the different uh, parts. Um, today, um, the material that we're made out of, atoms, is just a very small fraction of everything that we believe uh, is in the universe in the form of dark matter, dark energy, plus atoms. The chemistry that I'm going to be talking about is restricted to these small slices. But it's very important to us because we're part of that, that story. So let me um, immediately jump into the, the elements uh, in uh, the universe, synthesis of the elements. Hydrogen and helium uh, were formed at the time of the Big Bang uh, for three minutes. But the rest of the heavy elements in the periodic table were actually built up much later on uh, in processes associated with stars. So these elements via exploding massive stars, exploding white dwarfs, um, some small uh, number of elements were actually broken up by so-called energetic particles, cosmic rays, dying low mass stars, uh, merging neutron stars, very important. I'll talk, say something about that in a second. Uh, and um, artificial elements, synthetic elements that human beings have been able to create. Very remarkably, if you actually, um, the result of this complicated story, we actually look at the um, abundances of the elements. So, so hydrogen is by far the most abundant element. Then there's helium. You look at the heavy elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, sulfur, phosphorus, and iron. These are characteristic um, abundances that are more or less uh, uniform across uh, the entire uh, galaxy and actually in the known universe. There are, of course, fluctuations, but it's a very remarkable fact that these are sort of the characteristic um, abundances of these elements. Um, and that's due to the fact of, due to the uh, processes involved in, in their formation. I mentioned uh, these uh, purple elements, so-called merging neutron stars. There was a huge amount of excitement in the world of astrophysics um, in 2017, and um, you may have heard about this, where two so-called neutron stars merged uh, together, um, uh, emitting a gravitational wave signal that was detected. This is a very dramatic event where very, very dense um, uh, objects, the so-called neutron stars, which cont contain a mass of the entire sun within 10 kilometers, collide. The um, very explosive event, a lot of the neutrons get stripped off the neutron star and very rapidly build up these, these elements. So we have these elements, and, um, but, and, and those are the um, ingredients uh, within which we're going to um, look at chemistry. So the roadmap, my, my talk roadmap um, is as follows. We're talking about galaxies, interstellar medium, star forming clouds, protostars, planetary, proto planetary <coughs> disks, planets. And along the way, it's molecular chemistry is going to be guiding our understanding of, of um, these systems. The, the overall field, as Dave mentioned, um, is um, a sub uh, important sub-branch of astrophysics, sometimes called astrochemistry or sometimes called molecular astrophysics. And historically speaking, I'm going to sort of identify the first um, uh, appearance of this in modern form 
uh, in a very uh, famous paper presented by uh, Eddington almost 100 years ago uh, in which he speculated on the properties of material that might exist between the stars. Very little was known observationally at that time. And it's a very remarkable document um, what a um, talented theorist can come up with just from pure thought. Eddington, of course, was very important in developing our modern theory of stars uh, and laid the foundations for um, theoretical astrophysics as we know it in the 20th and 21st century. OK, so um, the dawn of chemistry in the first stars. So let me talk about that a little bit. Um, I've listed here what I think is probably the most important, also simple, but most important uh, <coughs> chemical reaction sequence in the history of the universe. And this was the production of molecular hydrogen um, uh, from the uh, constituent components, atomic hydrogen and electrons. Um, and the um, process is as follows. A hydrogen attaches to an electron. It's actually a remarkable fact that a single hydrogen atom can actually have two electrons bound to it. The second one is very loosely bound, and that's called uh, H minus. And the H minus reacts with hydrogen to form H2, molecular hydrogen. The reason why this is so important is that as the universe was cooling down, um, in order to form stars, one had to actually uh, enable the collapsing gas clouds to emit, uh, lose their energy. And the way they lose their energy, uh, the way they lost their energy, is by um, spectral line emissions of the molecular hydrogen, which enabled cooling and fragmentation into stars, as was first pointed out in the famous paper by Peebles and Dickey in 1968. Actually, in present-day galaxies at the current uh, epoch, molecular hydrogen forms more efficiently. This is not a very efficient mechanism, but molecular hydrogen forms more efficiently on interstellar grains, and I'll talk about that. Let me just, as a very uh, brief remark, uh, say something about H minus. H minus is a fascinating uh, uh, um, element or, or anion, fa fa fascinating anion, because actually it controls the way um, sunlight is actually produced. Um, it's the process of a hydrogen attaching an electron to make H minus emission of a photon on the reverse that actually controls the emission and absorption properties of the solar photosphere. And as pointed out by the brilliant 19th century mathematical physicist Kirchhoff, um, in order to produce uh, black body radiation of the kind emitted by the sun, uh, there is a universal relationship between emission and absorption. And in the case of the sun, it's actually H minus, which is doing the job. So when you actually see starlight and uh, see sunlight, in some sense, you're looking at H minus. Is that just a proton? That's, no, that's a hydrogen atom with two electrons attached to it. That's H minus? Yeah, that's H minus. Oh, okay. It's a hydrogen atom. Minus, but it's a negative charge. Yeah, so it's a negative charge because it has two electrons, Jim. OK, so I talked about the first stars. And I want to get actually to the current epoch. Um, for that, we'd have to wait um, 10 billion years. But uh, in order to avoid waiting that long, I'm going to actually simulate the development of the universe from that time to now. And this is a famous simulation called the illustrious simulation in which the development of stars, galaxies, and heavy, element, uh, heavy elements during the development of the galaxies is simulated uh, in a um, Fantastic computer simulation. So on the upper left, this is starlight. Um, here uh, is the accumulation of uh, diffuse gas uh, in the galaxies and in the intergalactic medium. These are, those explosions that you saw are um, uh, black holes in, um, accreting material and ejecting material out into the um, circumgalactic medium. Now I'm going to be showing you spectra. Um, which is our way of actually identifying um, molecules and um, atoms. Uh, let me remind the audience how that's actually done, because emission and absorption spectroscopy is the bread and butter of astronomy. The way it works is as follows. If you have a radiation source, say a pure hot black body emitting char the characteristic rainbow, you can shine that light through a cloud of cooler gas, and atoms and molecules in that cloud will absorb at specific colors or frequencies. Um, and those absorptions are tracers of the material in there. Or alternatively, that cloud of gas can simply emit rather than absorbing uh, at those same, same uh, frequencies, same colors, again, 
with a um, telltale sign of what the chemical abundances are. So it's an amazing fact that we can actually remotely sense out to the edge of the universe and determine what uh, the compositions are. OK, let's look at a picture of a galaxy. This is a typical um, spiral galaxy similar to our Milky Way. Uh, this is a relatively nearby galaxy. It's only uh, 20 million light years away. Uh, and what you, this is a real color image, beautiful image uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And there are several components that you can see here. There's a beautiful spiral structure. It's 60,000 light years across, roughly. The white stuff is starlight. The brown stuff is actually um, due to dust, dust particles, submicron dust particles that I'll talk about that are um, spread out in the interstellar medium in between the stars. And the red, uh, refer, red stuff is um, ionized gas, gas which is photoionized by hot stars in the vicinity of um, the gas clouds out of which the stars form. A typical galaxies like this contains 100 billion stars, many with planetary systems. Um, important point to note about a galaxy such as this or our own Milky Way is that star and planet formation is an ongoing process. It's occurring today still. Uh, we know that because we can see stars which are fairly young, only several millions of years old, when a galaxy itself is billions of years old. And another important component that I'll have something to say about in galaxies is that they contain, generally speaking, contain a central black hole. Here I've simply added a black dot to indicate that. In this particular galaxy, the black hole has a mass of one million solar masses. Now what I'm going to do right now is actually switch wavelengths. This is an optical image. I'm now going to move into the millimeter wave. So this is the same exact object uh, observed now um, in the millimeter waves, uh, where now what's being detected is uh, CO, carbon monoxide uh, emission. And here we're talking about rotational emission. So this is a spectral line which is produced when the CO molecule rotates at some speed and then reduces um, its rotation energy in a quantum emission, and this produces this emission line at this particular frequency, 115 gigahertz. There's a beautiful, there's a beautiful correspondence here, as you can see, between the position of the molecular gas emission in carbon monoxide and the positions of these red dots, which indicate the locations where stars are now uh, forming. That particular image was taken, that, that molecular image was taken with a uh, telescope, uh, in the which operates in the millimeter waves, is actually an array of antenna, antennas which operate in phase to produce this beautiful image. This one is an Im uh, interferometer, so-called interferometer located in the French Alps called Noema. There's a beautiful picture of it. Now this correspondence between molecular gas and star formation is often uh, illustrated in a diagram such as this. So I don't want to get technical here, so this is may, might be my most technical slide. The x-axis here is the um, surface density of gas in the disk. So if you actually look through that galaxy I just showed you and, and measure the density per unit area in gas on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, it's the rate at which stars are forming per unit area. And what you can see here is that there's a correlation between the star formation rate and the gas surface density, uh, the correlation actually is pretty well, de well defined once you go up about a certain surface density. But when you, if the surface density is too low, there's a, a great deal of scatter. Turns out that this, bound this transition from a situation where there's um, scatter and a fairly good correlation is associated with the transition from a state in which the gas is primarily atomic hydrogen to the position where the gas is a location was where the gas is primarily in the form of H2. So this correlation, which I've just shown you here graphically, uh, can describe in terms of this equation, simple, in, simple equation where the various pieces are uh, in the denominator is a time scale, a time for which these interstellar clouds collapse to form stars, a free fall time, say a million years. There's also an efficiency at which uh, stars form. So these, these Interstellar clouds don't um, collapse freely. They are actually inhibited, such that the efficiency is, is low, 1%. And this is probably due to the fact that there are turbulent motions inside the clouds, which uh, 
which uh, balance the gravity. And another important factor in this equation is the fraction of gas, which is in molecular hydrogen, which is related to chemistry, which is, I'm, which is what I'm um, talking about. So the important result of this slide is that star and planet formation are closely linked to the molecular interstellar medium. So two recent papers of my own that I've that related to the issue of conversion of atomic gas to molecular hydrogen are these two. Uh, one uh, with my French colleagues in Paris, and the second one with my former student Shmuel Bialy, now postdoc at Harvard, and our own Blakesley Burkhardt here as an associate research scientist at the CCA. Okay, so let me now zoom into one of these star-forming clouds. This is a famous picture of a dark, so-called dark cloud, which is about half a light year across, called Barnard 68. Its total mass is about two solar masses, so it's about the mass of a star. Most of it's in molecular hydrogen. When such objects were first seen in the uh, 18th century by the famous uh, astronomer William Herschel, he was terrified by this, and he cried out to his sister, who was also an astronomer, Mein Gott, da ist ein Loch in Himmel, or my God, there's a hole in the sky, because he actually said, see all these stars, and there's this dark thing there, which was really frightening. Well, um, we realize now that actually it is a dark cloud, and the way we know that is if you actually observe it in the infrared, you can actually see through it. And in fact, what's really beautiful here, you see this effect of so-called reddening, so there, it's sort of like seeing hundreds, hundreds of su uh, sunsets simultaneously um, as the starlight and back comes through in the infrared. This absorption is actually uh, controlled by, due to these submicron dust grains that are present everywhere in the interstellar medium. These dust grains um, are very important in large, in many ways, in controlling the chemical properties of the interstellar medium. Uh, for one thing, they actually absorb molecules in the form of ices. So this is a schematic diagram showing water, uh, carbon, uh, carbon, di uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methanol, formaldehyde, ammonia. And these uh, ices are <laughs> probed very beautifully in this um, famous spectrum done by the Infrared <laughs> Space Observatory. And I should note that a lot of the spectra that I'm going to show you actually have been done from space. And the reason they've been done from space is because they're they're at wavelengths at which the atmosphere of the Earth absorbs, so one has to go up uh, in space telescopes. This is, was done in the 1990s, the Infrared um, Space Observatory. <coughs> Here's a picture from another space telescope, the Spitzer, Spitzer Space Telescope, of um, the star-forming molecular cloud in Orion. What you see here is a uh, reflected and actually, not partially reflected, also some of this red stuff is actual thermal emission of these dust grains emitting in the uh, infrared wavelengths. Uh, zoomed in on a cluster of very young stars with ages of only a few million years. This is the so-called trapezium cluster, which was actually first discovered uh, by Galileo when he pointed his tiny telescope at the Orion Nebula, and this is what he discovered. There are hundreds of young stars in there. The amazing thing which I'll show you in a minute, is full of molecules. But let me take this opportunity to sort of give a summary of what these types of clouds, what their properties are. First of all, the interstellar medium as a whole is multi-phased, it's turbulent. Um, energy is injected by optical and UV starlight. Um, cosmic rays are these energetic particles which are much, much, which are moving much faster than they would be if they were at the temperature of the interstellar medium. They're produced um, in supernovae and supernova shock waves. The characteristic gas densities of these clouds are uh, very low, but 100 to uh, 10 million particles per cubic centimeter. That's much, much lower uh, than in orders of magnitude lower than the ba best laboratory vacuums that you can produce on the Earth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, relatively speaking, these densities are higher than, say, the typical intergalactic density. So from the point of view of uh, intergalactic space, these are relatively high densities. Temperatures range from about 10 degrees Kelvin to 1,000 degrees in isolated regions in degrees Kelvin. Another important property of the interstellar medium is dynamic and far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And the chemistry is actually relatively simple in the sense that because these densities are fairly low, um, one can actually focus on, on two-body reactions uh, in um, analyzing the observations. 
So with the Herschel Space Telescope, we've, ob we've observed uh, a huge range of molecular species. And here they're labeled. So I explained to you before that with emission absorption spectroscopy, one can identify the fingerprints. So let me just point out that water is seen. I'll say something about water in a bit. Um, HCN, another important one, formal cation, HCO plus, uh, dimethyl ether, methanol, et cetera. So this is an a beautiful example uh, of a re uh, molecular, star forming molecular cloud filled with these um, organic uh, species. Here's a complete list now of all of the known interstellar molecules to date. I think this is pretty, it's up to date. And the way I've um, organized this in terms of the number of atoms in each molecule, from the simple diatomics to three atom molecules to eight atom molecules, 10 atoms, and these interesting creatures, including C60, for example. If you look at them, um, you, you find that there are a large number of organic species. Many of them uh, are linear chains. And it's a whole big field just to try to understand how these, how these things are actually formed and where they come from and what they tell us. But I don't have time. This one could actually uh, do a whole course just on explaining this uh, table. So I'm not going to attempt that. I just want to point out a few highlights. Most of these observations are done in the millimeter wave with um, antennas such as this. Some can be done in the infrared. Some can be done even optically. OK. So a few highlights. Interestingly, some of these species were actually discovered in the interstellar medium before they were even uh, found on Earth or created on Earth. They're very reactive and hard to create in the lab. A fam very famous one is this one, HCO+. When it was first observed, it wasn't known what it was. Theorists then speculated that it was, in fact, HCO+, and eventually was created in the lab. There are also many isomers. In other words, um, the same distribution of atoms, but are organized in different formats, so isomers, and also many isotopes. I haven't listed all the isotopes in that table before. So for example, there's water, and there's also heavy water, HDO and D2O, where D is heavy hydrogen, deuterium. So let me um, talk about some case studies. Cyanid, the, let me start with cyanogen, CN. Um, I refer to this as a pre-war molecule, pre-Second World War, uh, because uh, it was actually discovered before the development of microwave technology, uh, which came out of the Second World War and enabled the detections of many of these uh, molecules. This was detected in uh, optical. And there were, here's an energy, so-called energy level diagram. So you, there are two absorption lines um, that are associated with this particular CN. There's a background star. The star light is going through this particular cloud, giving rise to these absorptions. The remarkable thing about this, because you have, because there are two absorption lines, there's this one and also this, this one here, which is due to absorption of radiation from an excited level, this J equals one state to J equals two up there, so that transition, that actually enables, um, uh, that actually enables a measurement of the temperature in which the CN molecule is residing, and, and there was this somewhat cryptic remark made by the well-known Canadian spectroscopist McCullough in 1940. He wrote, rotational excitation implies that the temperature of interstellar space is around 2.3 degrees. 2.3 degrees. But he had no idea what that meant. He had no idea what that meant, and it just sort of stuck, stayed there. We now understand that actually this was, in fact, the first measurement of the cosmic microwave background radiation field that was discovered directly in the 1960s by um, Penzias and Wilson, they actually measured the, directly measured this radiation around down at these frequency range in 1965, and they got the Nobel Prize. Had McKellar understood what he detected, he would have gotten the Nobel Prize. So I always tell students it's important, it's not enough to discover something, you have to understand what you've discovered, so obviously. <laughs> he also, I think he, I think by the time Penzias and Wilson made their discovery, I think he was no longer alive. So you also have to stay alive. <laughs> That's, okay. Um, carbon monoxide. Well, um, here's another. This is another. This is the same Penzias and Wilson uh, paper from 1970, and I love this one because here's the abstract. I didn't cut anything out. This is the entire abstract. 
So we have found intense 2.6 millimeter line radiation from non-galactic sources, which we attribute to carbon monoxide, period. Now this, this paper, well, I don't know if it's Nobel Prize worthy, but certainly very, but they already had their Nobel Prize, so. Um, but it is a very major discovery. And let me just show you a more modern version of this. This is the Orion, uh, const constellation of Orion, which probably you might recognize. And here's the Orion Nebula there, which if you have good eyes and you don't live in New York, you can see. Uh, and if one actually observes this in the CO transition, which I was just showing you before, this is what it looks like. So it's actually, the Orion Nebula is the tip of the iceberg of a much bigger structure uh, of molecular gas. <coughs> Here's another one, ethanol. So this is, uh, human beings love this one. Uh, so ethanol exists in space. Uh, here's a recent spectrum of it uh, actually located in the galactic center. The Sagittarius B2 is a molecular cloud in the center of the galaxy with a total gas mass of around 10 to the 6 solar masses, and it's sometimes referred to as the large molecule Heimat, Heimat being home in, uh, in German. And the amount of uh, alcohol there is uh, 10 to the 14 bottles of wine, so, but hard to collect. That's the fun molecule. Another interesting one is uh, propylene oxide, CH3, CH, CH2O. This was discovered not too long ago in 2016. This is the first chiral molecule discovered in space. So it's a molecule that has a left-handed version and a right-handed version. This is actually interesting, uh, potentially, uh, for thinking in terms of astrobiology and, and life sciences, because as is well known, although there's no clear explanation for it as far as I know, um, the amino acids some of the amino acids that exist in all life forms on Earth have a specific candidness, for example, left uh, alanine. And um, so it's interesting to find chiral molecules in space. And in fact, I, I always uh, point this out, this in Lewis Carroll through the looking glass speculates when Alice is talking to her cat, perhaps looking glass milk isn't good to drink, which is not true. You don't, if you drink reflected milk, you won't be able to digest it. Now, as far as I know, um, we still don't know whether there's, uh, in space, whether uh, there's a, a preference for left-handed and right-handed. That will be done um, when polarization studies uh, can be carried out, which can actually measure the, try to make a distinction between left and right. Another one is Buxminster Fullerene, C60. So this is a fascinating story. Uh, here, is, here is the molecule. So it's 60 carbon atoms uh, linked together in the shape of a soccer ball, football, uh, in European language, uh, which uh, the famous chemist Harold Croto uh, discovered in his laboratory in the 80s. He actually got the Nobel Prize uh, for the, in chemistry for creating C60. And the story, he was actually interested, uh, he, the reason he was doing his laboratory work, he was interested in understanding how some of those simpler molecules that I showed you in my list are produced. And he was trying to create them in the lab. And as an indirect byproduct of that work, uh, he uh, created this C60, which has vast implications also technologically and nanotechnology. There's a very beautiful article that he wrote in his Nobel lecture, which I recommend. It's readable, Symmetry, Space, and Stars, and C60. Remarkably, 20, more than uh, 20 years later, C60 was actually discovered in space, finally. It's actually also been detected in space. So a lot of the carbon in the universe actually in the form of, of these buckyballs, C60. That was discovered by Kami in 2010. OK, some theory. Let me move on to some theory. Well, the field, the, the understanding these uh, uh, chemi the chemical behavior is complicated. Let me just describe one simple scheme for building up uh, this complexity and building up some of these molecules. I'm going to focus on water. Uh, a cornerstone is something called H3+, which consists of uh, three hydrogen atoms and two electrons in the form of an equilateral triangle. Uh, it was searched for for many years because theoretically it was understood to be important, as I'm going to describe, and it was finally detected about 20 years ago uh, by Oka in interstellar space. The idea is as follows. Start out with molecular hydrogen. And a cosmic ray proton, this, these energetic particles which are zooming around, hits, hits it and ionizes the hydrogen. Uh, the hydrogen is then, this H2 plus is very reactive, 
and you build and you make this H3 plus in this way. H3 plus has the property uh, wanting to give up one of its protons if it interacts with one of these heavy elements. It's you refer to it as a universal proton donor or an acid. So any X will make the XH plus. For example, water. So here's the scheme for making water in space. Start out with an oxygen, uh, react with H3O plus. Make these species are very reactive with, with the residual molecular hydrogen. You run down to here. These ions uh, can recombine with electrons in a process called dissociative recombination, which sounds contradictory. It's dissociative and recombining. So it's recombining in the sense that the electron uh, is attaching to the ion, but it, that the energy released during that recombination breaks the molecule apart. So for, you go from H3O plus to H2O. This is a process which is driven, which occur, it's called ion molecule chemistry, which occurs at low temperatures and depends on the rate of cosmic ray ionization that makes this H3 plus. Remarkable thing about this diagram is that observationally, we've now seen in space all of these uh, species. We've measured them all, and we have a, pretty, we have a good understanding of these reactions. Uh, another process that occurs is photo, photo destruction. Someone can actually put these reactions on a computer and make predictions as to the abundances of these species. Let me just uh, show this without trying to explain it uh, too much. This is also, this, these are the surface processes that occur on dust particles. This is gas phase. Uh, this is on, these are on grain surfaces. But again, basically what's happening is that hydrogen um, atoms and oxygen atoms are landing on the grains, and they find each other, and then they come off, uh, producing water in free space or as ice on the surfaces of the grains. So let me show you some results of observations showing um, water in space. So here is a, here is a um, star, uh, which, is form which, is already, which is called a class zero protostar. It's a star in formation, which has this, see this dark kind of disk type thing. There's the earliest stages of, of a planetary system forming around the star. There's also a so-called jet um, of material coming out, uh, collapse Collapse in, in, astro in astrophysics, col collapse of objects, to, coll to collapse an object, you have to get rid of angular momentum, and that's very often done via a jet. And um, here's the same object, but now seen in water. So this is water emission along the jet in a particular spectral line, 179 microns, which is uh, fairly well, the, what, the upper state of this transition is above, is, about 100 degrees above the ground level, so this is warm water chemistry. One can actually measure the rate of uh, water loss from the system. Not good for the planets that are forming in there. The planets want to have water, but I guess we would want to have water, but there's a ma water loss, and the rate is one Earth ocean per 5,000 years. Again, this is beautiful, beautiful data from the Herschel Space Observatory about close to 10 years ago. Now, I mentioned water. Uh, mentioning water, I have to tell you this story, the story of the interstellar water masers. It's actually a somewhat older story. The first detection of water in interstellar space by, ta by the Towns Group, Charlie Towns, a very famous physicist, um, Nobel Prize for a nice invention called the laser. And he actually turned into an astronomer uh, and discovered the 22 gigahertz transition of water. And it turns out that this particular transition has an unusual property in that uh, this level decays very quickly. It decays so quickly, the bottom, sort of the rug is pulled out from under it, that you wind up having more population in this excited level compared to this l somewhat lower level. This is a so-called population inversion. And when you have a population inversion, if another photon comes, interacts uh, another photon with exactly this frequency interacts with, this, with the molecule. Instead of absorbing the photon, the photon stimulates the emission of another one. And this is the principle of laser. So, that, so this is an amazing story that the inventor of the laser on the Earth also discovered them in space afterwards. Um, he didn't get a second Nobel Prize for that, though. Now, I mentioned... I, I, mentioning the story about, of, la of masers in space, I cannot resist referring to this amazing paper by Albert Einstein from 1916, 
This is the paper in which Einstein actually understood, he was the first person to understand this principle of stimulated emission, um, which is, underlies the theory of laser beams. And I should point out, by the way, before I quote this, this paper, that the intensities in these single spectral lines can become enormous, thousands of solar luminosities in a single spectral line. That's just incredible. It's very non-thermal emission. So I want to I want to just show one line from this paper of Albert Einstein. So I'll start with the German: Die Konstanten A und B werden sich direkt berechnen lassen, wenn wir in Besitz einer in der Sinne der Quantenhypothese modifizierten Elektrodynamik und Mechanik waren. So he's the A and B here. The A and B refer to uh, constants that have to do with the spontaneous emission and the stimulated emission. I won't try, attempt to explain what they are exactly. But then he has this sentence. He actually discovered that there's a, direct, a universal relationship between these two constants. But then he has this amazing sentence in 1916, which only Einstein, somebody like Einstein can write, which is, well, OK, I, I know there's this relationship between A and B, and we could calculate directly. But for that, we need a modified version of electrodynamics and mechanics, and then we'll, we're going to do that now. You know. <laughs> OK, and I should say this, this paper, I always tell my students to read it because it's four pages long. It's available in translation. Use, these water majors actually have, a, have use. Um, uh, in many ways, one of them has to do with supermassive black holes, believe it or not. So NGC 4258 is a galaxy not too far away. Um, but it has a black, hole, a black hole in the middle, which is um, accreting material and becoming so-called active. Act, I, this is a topic for a different talk, the role that accreting black holes in um, affecting the way galaxies evolve. The remarkable thing is this. These, masers, these, um, maser, these water masers, when you detect them, they're very, very small. They actually have the, the actual size, they have to do roughly the size of the solar system. When they're very far away, say at the distance of a galaxy such as this, they're essentially points, very, 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 very bright points emitting at that particular frequency. And with a system of uh, radio telescopes spread out over the planet, one can, you can actually resolve these points. And it turns out that these, they're like these, these points are orbiting around um, a central object. And the fact that these points are so bright and resolvable with uh, telescopes which are spread out over the Earth enable the following simple measurement. High school, we know from, for circular motion, we know from high school physics that the acceleration is v squared over r. And what you can actually measure uh, is the, the uh, speed at which these spots are moving and also their accelerations, the rate at which their speeds are changing. So if you know v and you know a, you can infer r, the, the actual physical size. But if you know the angular size, if you know the angular size, which you can also see, you immediately know the distance. So this uh, system of maser spots actually enables a very accurate distance measurement. And one of the great problems in astronomy always is, is to figure out how to measure how far away something is. That's not, usually not easy to do. So the distance, in fact, is 2.3 times 10 to the 7 light years. Once you know the size of this thing, and you know the speeds, you know the, ma the central mass. So the black hole mass is 3.9 times 10 to the 7 solar masses. And from the distance um, and the speed at which this galaxy is receding from us due to, the due to the expansion of the universe, one can also determine the Hubble constant, 72 plus or minus 3 kilometers per second per megaparsec. OK, well, speaking of Kepler, uh, both the man and the satellite. Uh, I want to turn to my last topic, which is exoplanets and protoplanetary disks. We have knowledge now, today, thousands of planets around other stars. And in this nice plot, we can look at the size relative to the Earth and the orbital period. And there are different classifications, hot Jupiters, ocean worlds, lava worlds, rocky planets like the Earth empty zone here to be discovered. And planets form out of a circumstellar uh, disk, uh, condense out, planets are formed. These planets have been discovered in all sorts of ways. A rather unusual method, but a spectacular one, is simple direct imaging. So here are so-called 
uh, hot Jupiters. These are planets, the mass of Jupiter, but much closer to their parent stars are warmer and are emitting in the infrared can be detected directly with adaptive optic systems and you can see them moving around. Kepler would have been thrilled to see this. So you have four planets, one, two, three, four. This is not the typical way planets are, are discovered, but uh, it's, it's spectacular to see that. I always like looking at it. An amazing thing about the study of exoplanets these days, uh, which to me is uh, almost would have been science fiction not too long ago, is the fact that we can uh, do spectroscopy of the atmospheres of these planets. So the, uh, here's a, a planet, schematically, moving in front of its parent star. The starlight, the star is emitting its starlight, passes through the atmosphere, and then there, here are these absorptions again. And this is a, this is a beautiful spectrum, uh, paper of Wakeford, 2018, and she showed these, um, uh, sh shows this transmission spectrum. So there's these uh, peaks refer to more absorption. And very remarkably, these are simply water absorptions. And these are very well-known water absorptions. For example, in the Earth, we see them, and they have names. I don't know how these names came about. Rho Sigma Tau, Phi Psi, water absorptions due to vibrational motions of the water molecule. So it's water, water everywhere. Another breakthrough in this field um, or several breakthroughs have been provided by um, what I call the Great Astrochemistry Machine, which is a telescope which has been operational since 2011 in the Southern Hemisphere in Chile, an array of telescopes similar to the one I showed you in the French Alps, just more sensitive, more telescopes, enabling um, sensitive and high angular resolutions at the millimeter wavelengths that we're interested in for detecting molecules. So it's a fantastic system for studying protoplanetary evolution. Let me give you an example of what um, this, new this relatively new telescope can do. So here's an um, image of one of these protoplanetary disks taken from the best telescope pre-ALMA. And the size, this, the size scale is given by this little thing down here. It's 100 astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So this is, this is roughly, this is kind of like a solar system sized object. And what you see here is uh, thermal emission from warm dust grains. So these, these dust particles emitting. Turn on ALMA, and you see this beautiful structure that appears. It's a very famous picture by now. All these uh, rings and gaps. The interpretation of these rings and gaps is still, as far as I understand, not uh, fully resolved. Um, one natural interpretation is that these gaps have been opened up by planets in formation. And so there's a planet here which is forming, and it, sucks up the material at the radius of, it, of its orbit. These, could also, these, rings could, these gaps could also be formed by hydrodynamical instabilities. So I think it's still open question, but this is a, anyway shows the spectacular capabilities of the ALMA interferometer. Even more amazing is that when you, when it's possible today to do spectroscopy, emission line spectroscopy of these disks. So before I was showing those previous pictures are images in dust continuum, simply thermal radiation by the dust particles. This image is actually in a particular spectral line of the uh, isotope of HCl plus of that strange molecule I referred to before, it's just in terms of the hydrogen is deuterium in one of the rotational transitions. And you see this beautiful uh, double ring structure, and this calls out for, for theory. And in fact, it's, uh, understand, it's possible to understand this uh, in a two-step sequence, which I will just sketch very, very briefly. See, this is a, there's an inner ring and an outer ring uh, of this uh, DCO plus, and this is the way it's, way it's, it's made. Here's this H3 plus I was referring to before, uh, reacting now with the deuterated form of molecular hydrogen, so it's <coughs> hydrogen and deuterium, leading uh, to this, uh, to, to uh, deuterium switching into the H3 plus, so the deuterium is exchanged. Now this H2D plus, turns out, is somewhat more bound than H3 plus, and that means that if the temperature of the gas is sufficiently low, you get a big enhancement in the amount of H2D plus. I'm explaining this quickly, I know, but there, there it is. This is called chemical fractionation, technically. Then, second step, their, C, their carbon monoxide is frozen onto the dust grains here, but at a certain point, 
There's a, there's a region where the, the dust grains get warm enough by the, are warmed up by the central star that the CO comes off the ice into the gas phase, reacts with the HD, H2D+, plus, giving you this DCO+. Plus. This is a very sensitive probe, and sort of pro proves that there are actually two regions in this disk uh, where uh, CO is, is, is taken off the grains, either by thermal desorption or by non-thermal desorption, probably due to interactions with external cosmic rays. But just the fact that one can do this kind of analysis is, uh, is amazing. Here are more pictures. Um, various different uh, protoplanetary disks uh, with isotopes of the formal ion and hydrogen isotopes of hydrogen cyanide. And you can see they have different structures. Again, the um, chemical properties of these disks uh, vary from species to species. Again, all these emission uh, diagrams. Well, I'm coming towards the end of my talk, and um, I want to end with some comments about HCN, which I just showed you. So HCN is actually a well-studied molecule in interstellar space. I wrote a paper about, about HCN many years ago with my former student, Guy Boguer, where we worked out the chemical scheme for the production of HCN, hydrogen cyanide, in interstellar space. HCN, as excited at higher densities than is carbon monoxide, so HCN is a widely used species for tracing dense, denser material than what CO, carbon monoxide, uh, can do. Um, but there's an, actually an interesting story here. First of all, um, HCN comes with various names. This is Blauzoi, when the German uh, means uh, blue acid. Uh, the uh, 18th century chemists discovered that taking something called Prussian blue, which is a synthetic um, dye, makes this, there's a strange substance that comes out, which then was referred to as prussic acid. It was then eventually finally understood to be hydrogen cyanide, HCN. Now, HCN actually, in addition to being a useful pr tra trace pro uh, tracer of dense gas, actually may be extremely important for the emergence of life on our planet and other planets, because it's, there's, there are theories which claim that um, the development of biomolecules, bio in particular the development of the uh, synthesis of, R of early Earth RNA, started with uh, HCN, reactions starting with HCN, hydrogen cyanide, which, were, uh, which was delivered to the Earth you know, from uh, outer space, from comets that, inter that landed on, on Earth or on other planets. And this idea actually is, is, goes back to a paper by Oro in 1960 who pointed out that you know, if you take five of these HCNs, you get adenine, which is one of the um, uh, uh, molecules which are involved in the uh, DNA code. Okay, so this is very fascinating uh, and important. And actually, there's a whole Simon's collaboration working on this whole question of the origins of life, which I'm mentioning here. Um, remarkable, remarkable fact is that if you actually then go back to these protoplanetary disks and study the cyanides, so these are um, emission uh, lines of these different species uh, carried out by Karen Orberg from Harvard in a famous Nature paper. Beautiful result is that the abundances relative to HCN of these more complicated cyanides are about 10%. So these disks seem to have properties which are very, very similar to the chemical properties of solar system comets. So you know, if, if you then start speculating that um, HCN is a precursor to life out of the blue on Earth, and maybe on these other systems, similar processes are occurring. But of course, one then um, needs to explore this more further. In fact, the whole frontier in this field is actually relating the properties of these protoplanetary disks to the exoplanets that, that form inside. So let me, that's basically the story that I wanted to, to tell you, so the overview of this fascinating field, which is chemistry all the way, of galaxies, clouds, cores, stars, disks, planets, and maybe eventually life and us. And I'll end there. Thank you. So we have that time to take a few questions if people have them. Let me remind people when you ask your question to push the button. Oh, yeah. Thank you. This is actually something a little tied. In the beginning, you mentioned that uh, uh, or, or 
atoms higher than uh, uh, helium, lithium, uh, interstellar uh, synthesis. However, I recently read in a book by Robert Hazen, who mm. recently came out, that actually there was a Big Bang nuclear synthesis that also produced uh, up to carbon and maybe even up to oxygen mm. atoms, except a very small fraction, right? Uh, 10 to the minus 15 of the hydrogen uh, atom number. Could be. I don't know about that. Uh, I mean, I don't know about that. Okay. But I mean, I thought you might be able no, I don't. I can't really comment on that. But I mean, the, the heavy elements normally, you know, is, uh, are not thought not too much could be formed in the early universe because the universe was expanding no, too I quickly. No, he, but maybe a very, it, it's possible that trace amounts could have been formed. Well, yes. not, not zero, well, but it would probably still... The interesting point is that he suggested that the trace amounts are enough so that each of us contain originally synthesized carbon atoms. Mm -hmm. Because it's a very small fraction, but they were less a huge number. Okay. No comment on that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, can you comment on the uh, your value of the Hubble constant? What about it? Well, I see there's different values in the literature. Yeah, but yeah. I think I, I I rounded off to seventy. Yeah, you want there's some you, that are there's there, there, there there's that. there's at the moment uh, there's at the moment some conflict between uh, measurements of the Hubble constant uh, from the cosmic microwave background radiation and results that one gets from measurements uh, more locally using so-called Cepheid stars. And uh, that tension is there. Uh, I think it's, what is it, 69 to 73, or what is it? It's, it's a 68 to 73, it's a two sigma effect now. So um, it might be going away. I would, spe I, not being an expert on that, my hunch is that the uh, CMB uh, is more accurate and that there's some kind of systematic effect, which we're still trying to track down with these uh, local Cepheid measurements. And there's actually a recent paper arguing in, in that direction uh, by um, Wendy Friedman. Yeah. Over there. Go ahead. I'm just wondering, can you comment that whether the chemistry that we see in this universe is accidental or is it uh, a inevitable? I don't, accidental versus inevitable. I mean, I, what do you mean? Meaning that if it was potentially, if we had an alternate universe, or oh. if, if it formed again, would it be exactly the same way? <coughs> okay, I, that's a, that's a, that, my brain always explodes when I ask questions like that. <laughs> I mean, the, we, yeah, there could be alternate universes in which things, it, fundamental constants are different than what they are in the universe that I know about, in which case the behavior could be quite different. But that's, that's really speculative. I don't see how we could ever test or measure that. But I would say that given, you know, that there are, I mean, that there is a lot of randomness uh, in the way uh, our universe develops. And so I think that if you were to start the whole thing again, um, if that question even makes sense, I could imagine that it would, uh, things would not look exactly the same, but, uh, you know, there could be small differences, but um, there could be, but overall it would, might be similar. So there's contingency, yeah, there is, there's contingency. If it's certainly an evolution, we know evolution is highly contingent, so we, the fact that we exist is, is really uh, lucky, it's not inevitable. But this gets into philosoph philosophical things. Uh, yeah, so hope that helped. I don't know. Where? Hi. You briefly mentioned chirality of one molecule. Yeah. So are there any instances where there's some molecule for which chirality was measured? Or, or no, so I'm saying that's the first one that's been seen in space, as far as I know. And, it, and it's unknown at present whether there's any uh, in favor, it, whether left or right or favored. For that, you need polarization measurements, which have not been done. And is that possible soon? Or? I think so, yeah. Should be, yeah. Yes, yes. It would be, it would be absolutely amazing to discover that, in fact, there is a, a left-handed or right-handed bias. That would, most likely, that's not the case, but it you would know, be amazing to discover that. Yeah. So I think in a couple of years, that'll be known. Would we be able to observe if there were um, organic molecules closer to life, let's say certain amino acids in, in space, would we have the uh, yeah. 
Uh, yes, yes, uh, actually amino acids. So amino acids have not yet been this. There was a claim of an amino acid detection uh, that went away. In principle, one could see them. Uh, again, it depends on what the abundances are. The, I didn't say what, how abundant these molecules are. They, these, most of these molecules uh, in the list have abundances of at least uh, 10 to the minus 12, which is a very small number above hydrogen. So it's very, you can go down to very, very low abundances. There's no, re there's, there's no a priori reason why we could not detect an amino acid. They've not yet been found. It's been looked for. So looked for. In principle, we could discover um, life uh, if it were... Well, amino acid is, an amino acid is not life. Right. It's a precursor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, you know, I think one of the things that I learned from attending the uh, Simons collaboration on the origins of life is that maybe HCN is actually more interesting than some of these amino acids if HCN is really a precursor. So, yeah, yeah. A question over there. Go ahead. Are there any theories about how C60 exists in space? Is there yes. any general explanation to it? Yeah, there are theories. Um, okay, there's, there are certain kinds of molecules which I did not say anything about called, uh, they're called uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons, which are uh, flat pieces of carbon sort of a in, a, in a plane with hydrogens attached around it. Those are, tend to uh, be formed, we think, in uh, atmospheres or ex ex expelled atmospheres of stars in, in their late stages of evolution. And there's, um, there are actual theories about that these things actually are thrown out into space and eventually fold around and bend around and become uh, these buckyballs. So there are, there are actual um, calculations uh, Xander Thielens at Leiden has worked on that. Yes, yeah, so, so there, are, there are theories about it. Thank you. One last question. Uh, previously, they, some people did speculate that there may be life which is based on silicon instead yeah. of carbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your molecules that you listed, there is probably only two or three which contain silicon. Mm -hmm. So the question is, silicon is very, very abundant on Earth, but in here you okay. show barely anything. Yeah. The question is, is that well, what is in uh, interstellar, uh, interstellar space, <coughs> or the system, detection system, is not tuned to detect uh, silicon molecules? Okay, the answer to that is, I think, the following. I don't know, I can't really speculate as to how likely it is that there could be silicon-based life. Could be, because silicon is analogous to carbon. Why not? This, a lot of the silicon in interstellar space is locked up into these dust grains. So it, it, the silicon exists. It's just that you know, those molecules that I showed you in my list are, are in the gas phase, free-floating around. That's why, there isn't, that's, why you don't, that's why the silicon, which is inside the dust grains, that don't have their, uh, are not represented. But it's not that the silicon doesn't exist. It certainly does exist. And, I, you know, if, if it's possible to create life or to have life, life based on silicon, it, uh, there's enough of it. But I don't know whether that can be done or not, whether life could exist with silicon or not. I simply don't know. So, Great. So let's uh, all thank Amiel for a wonderful tour of the chemistry of the universe. <laughs>